how many MDs we have in the crowd? MDs. MDs, medical doctors. Okay, good. How many biologists? All the rest. Any, any, sure. any veterinarian? Good. So pretty much, uh, I think uh, the veterinary science, biological science, and, and medical sciences are pretty much very close. All right, so we can start with the uh, probably recording. Maybe we already started. And uh, I would like to um, express uh, my interest, my specialty in comparative pat pathobiology, comparative pathology and pathobiology. What is pathobiology? Pathobiology is the science that includes uh, um, all the specialties regarding the study diagnosed diseases. So our department and the people I work with are uh, pathologists, are virologists, in general microbiologists, bacteriologists, mycologists, protozoologists, people who study parasites, fungi. And the nice thing is that the veterinary pathologist is able to, with morphology and uh, conventional and molecular technique, to diagnose in vivo with biopsies and post-mortem with uh, autopsies, everything that goes into all the species. I started with fish, then I went to birds, then I went to large animals, cats and dogs, and then experimental animals. So the title is Comparative Pathobiology as Diagnostic and Research Tool for adv Advancement in Animal and Human Health. You all know now that um, there is that concept of uh, one health, one medicine, and the biologists, vets, and MDs often work together in research projects, small projects, and also um, large projects. I'm a vet, DVM. Um, I got a PhD, doctorate ricerca slash, slash PhD, and then I'm a diplomate of American College of Veterinary Pathologist. I will tell you about the college also a little bit. What I'm going to show you today is just a taste, a tip of the iceberg. So, because in reality, the science you are dealing with is immense, it's a 24 7 activity. So, I would like to just to give you a, test, a taste of what I've been doing the last few years and uh, with some reference to the past work. So, everything starts with a pathologist who is a member of uh, the American College of Pathology. In the United States, you can work if you are not a board certified pathologist, but uh, you get hired by, in academia private industry, diagnostic uh, enterprises, if you have these degrees. The degrees you reach after um, five years uh, of activities or three years of intense study. And we teach in academia. We do research and we serve, which is diagnostic service. We serve the community. Our activities are necropsy, so autopsies of any species, histology, histochemistry, indirect immunohistochemistry, insight hybridization, and then, of course, as case coordinator of the case in vivo and the case post-mortem, we use uh, uh, our ancillary procedures. So we, we, are the, we are the guy, we are the, special, we are the specialized person that signed eventually the, the final report. But, I mean, in, in any report that is bacteriology, microbiology, mycology, so we, we gather all the possible uh, basic and diagnostic sciences. So often things start in an autopsy room. This is our autopsy room these days, um, where we have uh, uh, multiple um, areas where we store the animals. Uh, we pass um, specimen to our ancillary procedures. We've got various tables for various pieces. And uh, sometimes it's pretty busy. So. That's the past place, the, the place where I was working before. You see, during a, an afternoon, you can have a couple of horses, uh, a small ruminant, a uh, couple of seals from the, from the stranding center. And uh, just to give you an idea what comparative pathology is, everybody knows what salmonellosis is. It's an important zoonotic disease you can get from animals, humans, you can get from, from food. Well, that's the call of a horse, which is all necrotic. That's salmonellosis in a horse. That's salmonellosis in a pig, so necrotizing fibrons colitis, necrotizing colitis in a pig, and necrotizing colitis in a reptile, in an alligator. So the lesions are the same. That's, that's a classic salmonellosis presentation. So with one, one picture, you identify a disease which can involve multiple species. And the presentation is the same. It's not so simple, but just to give you an idea, 
That's a classic example of how pat comparative pathology works. And then we can get uh, single cases or outbreak. For instance, this is the lung of a dog from a kennel, where around Christmas a few years ago, we had more than 40 dogs that die in a few days. So the comparative aspect, you can see this could be a human lung with, a, with coxa inducing bronchopneumonia. It's happened to be a streptococcus epidemicus in dogs. Then we move this specimen that we collect in buffer formal into a storage area where they stay for a few hours so they get fixed. And then we go to a trimming room where you can also do the autopsy of very small animals in communication with our autopsy room. And then we prepare the tissues in a cassette. You see these are the consolidated fixed lung of, um, of one of those dogs. And then within one day, so the following day, and in case of an outbreak, this is very important. We need to be fast to please our clients, our, also our scientists. This happened to be an outbreak in a kennel, but this could be an outbreak in a research institute. If you've got a bunch of beagles that get this bacteria in, it's possible. They can have the same destiny. And then we move to the histology laboratory, where we can do um, uh, preparation of slides and inclusion and staining, and then <coughs> Now we got better microscope than my first one I had in the early 80s in, in the Vetsky in Milan, but I, like, I took this picture of this poster in 1985 in the Sobe in Milan, I still use it. We moved to, to electron microscopy, to electron microscopy, to, um, um, to histomorphology, and then after a day, you can have a section like this that show you that this is a completely pneumonic lung in comparison with a negative control, which is here. Normal lung versus uh, um, bronchopneumonia with plenty of neutrophils. At the same time, we can select some areas and do a special stay and do some histochemistry, histochemistry, a GIMSA, a Gram, a Zil Nielsen, anything you want, a silver stain, a gyrophilic stain. And you can see here that there are some cocci. So after one day, with a suspicion of a epidemic streptococcosis in dogs, killing them all, and then one day later, also with the help of our, help of our microbiologist, we had a diagnosis of streptococcus epidemicus pneumonia. At the same time, our molecular biologists rule out influenza, rule out another couple of infectious diseases of dogs, and we had our diagnosis. And then if you want, and we do that very often, we move to indirect immunohistochemistry and incitabilization, and for some studies, rarely to incite to PCR. But these are all things you know, because they are research institutes, so probably use the same technique. A few words about immunohistochemistry. I apologize. I have to put it there. I'm sure you all know it in practic in practically and also in, uh, in theory. Direct technique, indirect technique, which is uh, used uh, quite a bit in, uh, in pathology, and then a technique that I love because it allowed me to detect very small quantity of antigen, especially uh, viruses that have one cell every few slides, like uh, some RNA viruses, which uh, produce dramatic lesion being present in very small quantities, like blue tongue um, and some exotic animal diseases, a polymer, which allow you to amplify a lot. So we, we detect viruses, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, cell markers, hormones, any protein. But these are all things that you, noble crowd, know pretty well. Very inexpensive, permanent staining. I got slides that I developed in the, in the early 80s, still in my files. The stain does, doesn't go away like FA. And a few examples, listeria in the portal areas of a newborn kid with thrombosis and presence of uh, listeria bacteria, classic neosporosis or toxoplasmosis in the skin of immunosuppressed uh, uh, patient. In this, in this case, a dog that had some immunosuppressive therapy because there was a renal transplantation. Histone proteins the, in a piglet where we did a study on histone. Classic uh, uh, identification of the pattern of stain you see kids in some muscle tumors. And then, of course, the queen of uh, the sciences, in my opinion, virology, where there, there is this arbovirus has been detected in the cerebellum of this uh, bird. This is a classic uh, Easter encephalitis pattern in the cerebellum. There is more virus than brain here. And then dual staining um, in, uh, in red, 
the protein of this uh, Easter equine encephalitis virus and then the simultaneous detection of the RNA that uh, we did in collaboration in some deer study with uh, Professor Kupel of um, Michigan State University. And I got a soft spot for uh, zoonotic diseases. That's a previous work at University of Pennsylvania. See, we developed a model with uh, Professor Schifferly of uh, pneumonic plague. A classic pyogonoloma is a mouse in a mouse, macrophages and neutrophils, very similar to the formula you can see in humans in the Middle Age and here, later in other countries, like in Mongolia, you know there is an ongoing outbreak of uh, black plague in Mongolia affecting species, several species, and then the detection of this uh, bacteria within the pyogonoloma. So regarding my research activity, one is collaborating with uh, basic scientists on experimental disease and also some personal projects, not only collaboration, and then the part that uh, I got a soft, soft spot for, which I, which I worked the most during my career, diagnosing and discovering new natural diseases. And that's, it's like Christmas every day. You get a body from your door, you get a biopsy, you don't know what's coming in. It's like to, to have a, um, a slumber party where you don't know your guest. You come in and you diagnose it. It can be something extremely dangerous also. You can have a zoonotic age, it can be something very basic, like a, like a benign tumor. Uh, from the skin of a, of a patient, which is uh, a 30 seconds diagnosis with, um, with a, a very easy two things to detect. Or you can have something that you need to use your biosecurity level, tr level three lab to take care of the business. Um, a few words about arboviruses. Um, I've been historically working the last uh, 18 years with West Nile falvivirus and East Rico encephalitis alpha virus. But recently there was that Zika virus outbreak so we have a very uh, clever investigator in our group, Dr. Christofferson, that jumped on the project, got the agents, and, uh, and we inoculated some mice to, to try to realize the, the genital and the neural pathogenesis. Also, she worked on Lassa fever and dengue flavivirus, which is some project I hope to um, expand with her in the future, especially Lassa fever, which is a very interesting disease that produces a very dramatic vasculitis in in the patients. You all know about Zika. Uh, there is an Asian virus, there is an African virus, and then this uh, strain moved to South America and a couple of years ago created uh, outbreaks of uh, microcephaly. Um, it's a flabby virus like uh, West Nile virus, and it produced uh, this kind of situation. Very sad stories. And uh, so, my colleague at this specific mouse population, which were particularly receptive to this agent, and we were able to see how the virus infects the neurons in the neocortex, so mimicking what potentially could have been doing in uh, perhaps some newborns, infants, and maybe some adults, classic colonization of multiple neurons in the cytoplasm, RNA virus, or mainly cytoplasm in this case. With minimal lesion, you can see there is a little bit of gliosis in the background, but not much inflammation in this section. And then, very interesting finding in the epididymis, where in association with a necrotizing or necrosoperative, plenty of neutrophil here, epididymitis, there was a very, very, very prominent infection of the epithelial cells of the epididymis. So localization of the virus within the cells and then cytopathic effect and uh, inflammatory influx. So you can understand that large quantity of virus can be produced in the semen by patient that uh, they, get a, they have a transit, transit inf infection. If you show this to a pathologist without, without uh, um, that's a very serious business. Um, if you show, see this, if you show this uh, finding to a pathology without the staining, you make a diagnosis of gonorrhea immediately. It is a viral disease, even if there are plenty of neutrophils. And then in absence of lesion, so the perfect carrier status, at least at the moment, we were able to identify virus within the cytoplasm of germ cells and even within uh, the, the head of mature spermatozoa. So pretty much we clarify what the MD speculated about the transmission of this disease uh, from, from, from the, the shedder, who is, a, is, is, the, is the male, to, to the female. Um, some colleagues at the primary center are doing some study now on the, on the pathogenesis of the microcephaly in um, in uh, non-human primates. 
Uh, we are a strong group on herpes viruses, and uh, I would like to focus with a few words on Equi Herpes Virus 1 and 4, which is one of the most important uh, killers of the equine industry. It's, uh, it's as important in the equine industry as HIV would be in the human population. Of course, totally different virus. It's got several forms, including abortigenic, paralytic, respiratory. It's a huge deal. It's very difficult to produce vaccines that are protective. There are some vaccines against the abortigenic form that you need to inoculate your mare for five times to hope that there is some decent protection. And, uh, and so I apply my study on the diagnostic uh, uh, neonatal pathology <coughs> to, to, to try to help my collaborators, my, my basic scientist colleagues, to develop uh, potentially some vaccine to see how uh, they could be protective on mice and then protective on horses. The classic pattern of the infection in equine fetus, after passing the placenta, the virus multiply with endothelial cells and then through the endothelial, the sinusoids, invade the, the hepatocytes and produce some multifocal necrosis. This is the same mechanism in the fetus, all the possible herpes viruses, including, including humans. Genital herpes in humans can do the same in the human fetus. And then classic vasculitis, with colonization of uh, endothelium, myocytes, and pericyte here in cross-section with some necrosis. And this will be in a neurologic format. At the moment, doesn't have a vaccine. So we have all heard of horses are worth millions of dollars that get this paralytic form. And sometimes you need to be euthanized because we don't have a vaccine that protects within this for, for this form. So we did some inoculation, some mice, and then we studied the protection of the vaccine. Classic uh, necrotizing bronchiolitis due to EHV1 in a receptive mice, mouse. And then we evaluated uh, pretty much the onset of the lesion, the severity in comparison with the, with the quantity of virus in these uh, mice inoculated with a highly pathogenic EHV1. Then we got a strong group that works on uh, Rickettsial diseases, and uh, where we studied the pathogenesis uh, of these uh, diseases, which is uh, surprisingly, there was not much in the literature before we started a few years ago. Some uh, surface antigen and some protective human immune response against these uh, superficial proteins, which is very important for the infection. And a few examples, for instance, in these mice, where we studied the pathogenesis and how protected the vaccine was, we were able to identify the agent, some pyogranolomas within the liver of these mice and see how the mice were moving from endothelial cells to macrophages and eventually to the liver of these mice. We were able also to identify the, the macrophage, here identified with a classic uh, mi macrophage marker, um, IB1, how the cells were predominant in the infection. Here, the stain emphasizes uh, circulating microphages <coughs> within the blood vessel near the endothelium and also copper cells in the liver, and compare this finding with uh, the co-localization of bacteria within the circulation within the endothelium. And then sometimes, <coughs> at the microscope, you see no lesions, so you think you're having some animals that were, were that or, or non-infected, or where the, the bacterium maybe is not significant because it doesn't produce any lesion, but in this heart section, and here we've got some heart for Professor Jacka, since your research group emphasized on this organ, uh, we have plenty of bacteria within the cytoplasm of these endothelial cells of this uh, heart valve in total absence of, uh, of lesions. Then we study quite a bit uh, bacterial pneumonia in collaboration with Dr. J, who's got a very busy lab where he studies uh, um, we got some model of um, pneumonia in uh, normal lung or in smoke exposed, exposed lung because in um, the lab also take in consideration uh, lungs that are uh, weakened by um, uh, other uh, interaction with other predisposing factors. And uh, Dr. J studied all these bacteria with the opportunity to, to have a study together with uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, which is a very important pathogen. All these are very important human pathogens as well. Some are animal pathogens as well. And pretty much with, uh, with, uh, we collaborate on this model of pneumonia, classic bronchopneumonia in a mouse with uh, plenty of neutrophils and macrophages within a bronchus, and then plenty of flooding of neutrophils and macrophages within the alveoli with some thrombosis as well. 
So sometimes the study doesn't need much. You just need uh, a good uh, planning and then just uh, a nice Chinese stain, which cost uh, how much? Eight dollars. And pretty much you can carry on a, um, a very expensive study using um, a very cheap tool, which is histology. You know, why do they pick us? Because a veterinary pathology knows the natural disease. That's an equine chorion with plenty of Klebsiella. You can recognize that the bacteria have a capsule, so classic presentation, classic morphological presentation, Klebsiella, and then this is a calf with a classic brown pneumonia, in this case, Klebsiella. Very common in falls. Klebsiella is a very important equine pathogen. And we talk about horses. Horses, financially, are as important as humans. They are, we are talking about millions and millions of dollars in uh, investment for the race industry, and many are kept as pets. And they are model for human diseases. Then there are some studies that can be conducted just with uh, histopathology, a few special stains, like the effect of blueberry feeding on the nephritis of these rats, which are predisposed to this chronic progressive nephritis. So very simple, some controls, some animals being, being fed blueberries and animals not being fed blueberries, and even a non-use uh, eye to histopathology can understand that here the nephritis lesion are very severe with fibrosis, infiltration, dilatation of the tubules. Very easy study. So eat plenty of blueberries, guys. And then we got a section with Dr. Lopez, who is a surgeon that carry on a lot of studies uh, on heart tissues, especially on encondral ossification. And these days, there is a lot of study about some specific uh, scaffolds that are used to favor the repair in bones. And so this is the scaffold, which has been surrounded by these uh, mesenchymal cells. And here you can see the encondral ossification. And this is another type of scaffold, which is a rather fibrillar, where instead there is a reaction with some some um, fibroblasts, some fibrosis, some macrophages. So considering, for instance, uh, some very basic studies on the myocardium here, you can adopt this technique, which are very inexpensive. It can lead you to very interesting findings. Some dental research. Here there are some skulls on, of some rats where we study the progressive ossification after removing a, a section of the calvarium, the various stages, fibrous tissue, fibrovascular with uh, a beginning of fibrosis and then uh, cartilage formation and then ossification. Very simple study but very rewarding. And then <coughs> several people do that on the planet and uh, classic inoculation of uh, human cancer cell within the subcuties of a nude mouse and then you let the, the tumor grow, and then you use your treatment, any treatment you want, and you see how much necrosis you develop within the, within the tumor mass. You can see here there is at least uh, one third of the tumor has been, after this treatment, which is a combination of chemotherapy and uh, exposure to certain type of lights, you can evaluate grossly and at the microscope how much tumor you're able to uh, neutralize. That's just the tip of the iceberg of our research activity. You can see we cover several infectious agents and several type of uh, diseases. And now I would like to tell you about uh, you know, my first law, which is uh, diagnostic pathology. And I like to say that, uh, use the, the, the phrase that me and my mentor in Cornell University had in common, it's like Christmas every day because you get uh, animal through your doors, you see them in the clinic, and then they get euthanized, and then they deliver them to you very quickly. It's not like uh, in human pathology, you need to wait 24, 48 hours. There is autolysis. You can euthanize a horse for good reasons. You can euthanize a dog. And then after 10 minutes, it's on your table. So you got fresh tissue. So it's the best way to carry on a post-mortem examination. In Santa, you get parcels. For instance, here is a kitty. And this kitten had access to outdoor activities, and outdoor activities are very fun for kitties because kitties love to be in the dark, love to hunt, love to explore the, the, the world. But at night, there are coyotes, there are foxes, there are bobcats, and there are also animals with uh, rabies. And what's happened is that they get, they get bitten, and then they get come back home, they start becoming neurological, and then they, they get terminal neurological, they need to get euthanized, they come as to us in a box for the diagnosis of uh, to rule out rabies first. 
Rabies is a very important disease which is present in the territory, even here around um, our lovely city. And uh, so we, we, are <coughs> we perform every day um, rapid diagnostic text, uh, text, uh, test on um, Lisa viride, classic disease that causes polyencephalomyelitis and ganglionitis. And then we use FA, but uh, if you get uh, a brain uh, in a jar where the brain has not been tested for with, uh, with FA, it's already fixed, we can also use immunostochemistry as a backup. And here's a classic uh, presentation of rabies where there is more, neuro, more, more virus than, than brain. Plenty of virus within the cytoplasm of these neurons, within the fibers. That's a highly infected uh, neuron of one of the brainstem uh, nuclei. And then West Nile flavivirus. Uh, we have plenty of this virus uh, in the United States. It came from, uh, um, from the Middle East in 1998, started affecting all humans and, um, and some uh, birds of a zoo collection. Classic polyoromboencephalomyelitis in mammals, systemic infection in birds, transmitted by mosquitoes. It is the most sensitive bird regarding West Nile virus infection. It's a huge deal in the United States. In three years, went from New York to <coughs> California. I was at the time in Pennsylvania, and I was, had the privilege to see the first horses with the disease and some birds, so I immediately jumped on, the, on, the, on this condition, and I built up my PhD around it. And uh, so it was, you know. You need to be an opportunist when you got these natural diseases. It's like when you take advantage of a weakness of your adversary in volleyball, you know that there is someone that is not very good when he's in receiving, then you, you keep hitting on that, on that guy, so it's for natural diseases. Classic uh, hemorrhagic myelitis uh, in a horse, the vertebral bodies, I split this in a half. You can see how hemorrhagic this disease is. In fact, it's very similar to dengue. It's a classic hemorrhagic disease. The vessels are indirect targets of this condition. And the virus within the neurons, within the macrophages, inducing satellitosis in these neurons, in glial nodules. You can always go back to the slides and then scrape these areas with the virus and then send it to your molecular diagnostician because we do a lot of molecular characterization of viruses from the paraffin blocks not from fresh tissue, which is a great advantage. And then viruses within the neuron fiber with a little bit of inflammation here. Another one is glial nodules. The disease is very similar to humans. Horses, uh, other mammals, and, and humans got a very similar pattern in the brain histologically. In birds, if the mammals are paratenic host of this condition, so they are dead hand, birds are pretty much the host that the virus like and use them to go around and to spread. Mosquitoes and certain birds. That's a flamingo, which is a very sensitive uh, animal for this disease. The <coughs> brain necrosis and hemorrhage and this uh, myocardial necrosis, and that's a crow. In the crow, there is a multi-system infection which is associated also with a lot of hemorrhages within the gut. And look at how much virus there is in birds. That's a crow, that's an intestine. All the crypts are loaded with this infectious agent. No many lesions in um, grossly. Plenty of hemorrhage, but not much inflammation. Very similar pattern to sudden uh, enteric agents in uh, higher uh, vertebrates. Uh, you can find plenty of virus within the hematopoietic system, circulating macrophages, spleen, bone marrow. So the virus is even able to infect the hematopoietic cells before they get into circulation. The cloaca of a crow, so I took the terminal intestine, split them in a half, prepared the slide, and then this is a longitudinal section of the lymphoid tissue. Look at how much virus there is in this terminal portion of the intestine, showing that uh, with cannibalism, with contact with shed of feces and other fluid, there could be a bird-to-bird -bird infection. So simple observation at your microscope can give you can give a lot of room to your pathogenetic speculations. Pancreas, from a blood vessel, from the endothelial cells, the virus expand into the parenchyma. Myocardium, we justify the myocardial necrosis I show you at the beginning. Kidney, the virus loves the, um, the tubules. So, two different presentations. In the paratenic host, a little bit of virus in the brain that creates a lot of damage. In these birds, lots of virus that 
for a long time stay in balance with the host. Very interesting presentation. Uh, Easter encephalitis, there are specific viral diseases in the Americas which is transmitted by specific agents which uh, determine some very specific geographical location. We present uh, severe clinical signs in horses, other animals, and create severe um, um, cerebral disease in, in humans. It's a very important condition. Identification in the neurons in association with the neutrophilic encephalitis. You can see there is a lot of virus here, so it's very simple from a, with a molecular technique or with uh, a simple immunohistochemistry to make a diagnosis. West Nile virus, if you get it, most likely you will survive. You have a horrible headache. Um, and but you know, gen with anti-inflammatory with care, you will get back in business. We had some colleagues that got it. But Tripoli, e, if you get into your brain, or you die, or you have per permanent mental damage, uh, per permanent uh, cerebral damage. So it's a very important agent. It star starts in the northern United States. It goes down through the east coast with these vectories, and then uh, affect all the southern states without affecting the west coast because the the vector is specifically related to those geographic areas. It affects the myocardium with myocardial necrosis. So theoretically, there could be some models of this uh, condition using some uh, myocardial necrosis features, if you are interested. Classic necrosis with the virus identification. And then in birds, same behavior than in mammals, plenty of virus within the brain in the Purkinje cells. And very sensitive animals are ratites and then pheasants. So when, when he hits the pheasant farms, he kills almost all the birds. Very interesting disease. We always keep an eye on influenza. We know influenza is a huge deal, especially this year, because the vaccine failure and uh, the spreading of the condition. From animal to people, from people to people, you know, you all know about influenza. Classic multisystemic disease. Birds are reservoir of the condition. Um, very important in humans, but horses and dogs these days as well. There are some very important sen sensitive species. Here you have the lesions that influenza can cause. It's uh, fatal in certain parts of the population. We are all concerned about the reemergence of that strain that killed many young people uh, during the First World War, the H1N1, which, which is around, not that strain, but uh, similar strains. And look at how the virus behave. That's an outbreak of uh, influenza in turkeys in Italy in 2001. They had the privilege to examine and to diagnose. And uh, look at how the virus, in absence of inflammation, invade the pancreas. These birds, when you open these bird, this ha birds' head, the pancreas look like an hematoma. You couldn't see the pancreas, it was just necrosis and, and blood. Why? Because the... the, the, because the because the, the agent was progressively invading all the pancreatic cells, one of the few RNA virus that can, can invade the nucleus and the cytoplasm, inducing this severe peracute uh, pancreatic necrosis. A very in interesting disease. Hypothetically, a similar strain can one day cause the same disease in humans. It has not been described, but it can do it in a in a vertebrate can also induce, it in, in, induce the same lesion in a primate. We are responsible surveillance of, uh, for prion diseases. You all know about, the, know about Kuru, about Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. You all know about mad cow disease, the BSC. It is a case of BSC. I took this picture in England in 1992, and it is the immunostochemist identification of similar disease in sheep, which is called scrap. And you all know this uh, kind of condition. The animal, the animal diseases, multiple species involved with similar um, prion proteins, are a good model for some uh, uh, sporadic but very important uh, um, um, sp spongiform cephalopathies in humans. And you all know about Kuru. Kuru is, is, a, is a very famous condition. It was transmitted from, uh, through family, consuming the, the brain of their ancestors or their uh, death uh, to transmit the soul and uh, the intellect. And we pretty much uh, collect the OBEX and we do some histology and then we send the OBEX to the Central Diagnostic Laboratory for a yes or no diagnosis. 
very few cases in the United States. I remember two or three cases. So we are, we are able to keep the disease out of it. It's a very important political disease, like rabies. And since we are talking about brainstem, I had yesterday something that could be interesting for you. Who has got the age of, um, of Professor Jack and myself remember the first important outbreak of listeriosis from sweet cheese in the 70s in Switzerland? Because this bacterium low to grow on the surface of uh, uh, gastronomical preparation like the Swiss cheese, the Emmental, but also other products, uh, hot dogs, uh, even cantaloupes. Uh, the the cantalupo, which is the melon that is produced in, uh, in Rome and it's very popular in the United States. If you are lucky in the brainstem, cerebellum here and brainstem here, which is close to the area that I show you, um, uh, we collect for um, spongioencephalopathies. Um, you can see some lesions. And uh, in cattle, if you make a section, or in non-human primate, if you make a section of that portion, you diagnose listeria. It's a disease that induces uh, perin uh, perinatal mortality, abortion, systemic disease, and rhombencephalitis. Here there are some uh, ruminants and a pig with uh, a systemic disease, multiple microabscesses in the liver. The histology is very easy. You see microabscesses with plenty of macrophages and neutrophils, and with immunohistochemistry, you can see the bacteria contained within the cytoplasm of neutrophils and macrophages. And uh, sometimes we get busy. That's me a few years ago. You see, we do, you, we do them all. Tisa was a very old elephant of a certain zoo, and she was uh, 40 years old, so that's a very respect, respectable age for a, on an elephant. And she, she was treated extremely well, but eventually she developed uh, a severe uh, degenerative joint disease and then some um, enteric ulcer because of the continuous treatment with um, anti-inflammatory drugs, so we complete a necropsy. Just to tell you that we, we are really busy, we are, we are very much projected to try to help uh, to preserve endangered species, which are diagnostics. I personally care a lot about this thing. I'm a, I don't know if we can keep it in the record, but I'm a tree hugger. I got my personal opinions, but I really care about uh, endangered species and uh, preservation and conservation. And then also a um, collection of uh, uh, water creatures, sea creatures, and uh, freshwater creatures. So um, f for me, it's routine to get uh, bodies of um, uh, stranded animals or animals from the aquarium. That's a sun tiger shark. Classic uh, examination of the mouth where there is some gingival hyperplasia and then cross-section of the head to see the organs uh, and uh, to see which kind of condition they can have. And unfortunately, when these animals get transported from aquarium to aquarium, they can have some trauma which then uh, uh, worsen during the period of time, associated maybe also by the fact that sometimes they hit uh, the glass of the aquarium. So we try to de characterize the pathogenesis of this spinal cord injury in this animal. Plenty of um, ectopic ossification, necrosis, and remodeling of this uh, vertebral colon of these uh, um, cartilaginous um, animals. Uh, certain uh, fish collection are very important, but so very important fish for uh, food consumption. In the United States, uh, um, catfish are very important, as much as trouts in Europe. So for me, it was uh, immediate to bring my trout expertise to catfish disease. And this is the classic Edward Ziella ictalura infection in some catfish. And the infection produces exophthalmus. And it's called hole in the, hole, hole in the head disease, because these bacteria are able to dig a perforation in the skin of the head and also eat up the cartilage and even eventually induce an encephalitis and also some rhine encephalitis. So very important financially from the pathogenetical point of view of bacterial disease uh, through species. Then we have a lot of alligators, where we see multiple infectious diseases. Alligators in the wild are healthy like alligator, like fish. But as soon as you put them together in very close contact, when you put everything human together in a school or in a, in a military refugee or in a camp, and they start developing infectious disease, it is a classic case of chlamydiosis in alligator. Same lesion that you see in humans, that you see in birds, you see in koalas. Conjunctivitis, pneumonia, hepatitis, sepsis, and uh, this is the classic detection of chlamydia-like 
organisms within the conjunctiva of these animals. See, gross, gross lesion which indicate a possible infectious agent, salmonellosis versus another agent versus chlamydia, and here is the proof. That's very important because alligators are, are a huge deal in the South United States. Uh, part of the animals goes back to the wild to, to nurture the wild population, and part becomes Gucci bags, and parts feed the local population. <laughs> you prefer to eat an alligator that's got a brain like this, or you prefer to eat a chicken that could be a pet? Well, you know, maybe you want to consider going alligator or something. Then we got a project on chameleons, and chameleons for uh, preservation, conservation, and reintroduction. Unfortunately, this animal develops a natural diseases. This animal is severely emaciated. Why? Because it develops a pseudomonas pneumonia, and also has got plenty of parasites. So you can bring your pathology, comparative pathology expertise that you get from human pathology, from uh, pet pathology, from equine pathology to your special species. This is really fascinating. We started this project a year ago. I love it because these are all new diseases. Classic anatomy chameleon, uh, the salomic cavity, the lung, the heart is underneath here, the intestinal packets, the spleen. Uh, more intestine is the testicle, which is very dark because they got a layer of uh, melanocytes on the on the um, on the surface. And then uh, <coughs> my heart is very much on preservation conservation. A juvenile eagle that was shot down by a, a poacher, and a poacher is braconiere. And uh, and here plenty of um, uh, pellet wounds, and was hit in the heart right here. And this leads me to introduce uh, um, forensic pathology. That's a puppy. And forensic pathology becoming a huge deal in veterinary medicine. It is, it is a huge deal in, uh, in human medicine. And often we collaborate with police officers and also with forensic pathology of human uh, medicine because they find the dead dog and they find the dead humans. And we need to figure out what's happened to the dog. And the other guy needs to figure out what's happened uh, to the human. We, we get called together in court. This is unfortunately a very common event. A puppy has been mistreated by someone, like an uh, angry boyfriend that killed, that started kicking the puppy, like in this case. And that, that's a very easy diagnosis. You open the calvary, you see hemorrhage in the brain, you see hemorrhage in the meninges, and then you do histology, you don't see any infectious agent. You do your microbiology just to cover your left ear in front of the judge, and you make a diagnosis of trauma. That could be hit by a car, hit by a stick, kicked. So forensic pathology is very important. Very important. Or this, uh, this is an Italian case. Uh, that's uh, illegal detention of some uh, Carduelli songbirds, in Italiano Cardellini. And this guy put them all in small cages, and these guys were thrashing around and got brain hemorrhage and died. See, something diagnosed is very easy. You know the species, you pretty much uh, remove the skin, you find the hemorrhage. Then you follow up with some histology just to cover your legal back, but uh, you have a diagnosis pretty much in 30 seconds. Laboratory animal natural diseases, to, to be of your interest, because I'm sure you have animal collection. And unfortunately, if you introduce certain animals or some fomites, they can develop a certain important infectious disease. This is probably the, one of the most important diseases of uh, rodents, and this is the mouse hepatitis to coronavirus, inducing severe hepatic necrosis, and the microscope some multiple uh, syncytial cells that can affect your mouse colonies. You have your nice mouse colon they're using for experimental study, behavior, whatever you want. And then the virus come in, and a few days later, you've got a bunch of dead mice. And if you consider how much mice cost these days, well, that's what you can get. Cross-section. In reality, this liver is so small, of course. That's a closer. Uh, or, you know, you want to know why your old rats get certain lesions. That's a classic rat mammary fibrodenoma. For someone that is not in the field, could be something unusual. For us, you know, we see it all the time. When the rats get old, they develop uh, um, fibroadenoma. That's a pet rat, by the way. You want to have a nice pet, rats make fantastic pets. They're very intelligent. They learn tricks. The only problem is that they don't live very long, two years, three years, if you, are, if, you are, if you are lucky. And when you lose them, it's like losing a cat or a dog. So you can teach them how to get things from ropes, how to play basketball. It's amazing. Go on YouTube, you see plenty of rat videos. Very intelligent animals. In the wild, they carry quite a bit of diseases. Rat pay fever, leptospirosis, so be careful. And then, 
a putpourri of uh, infectious diseases that can occur spontaneously in your rabbit colonies. Classic pulmonary metastasis or sarcoma, or the classic tumor that she rabbits get when they reach a certain age, the classic uterine adenocarcinoma, metastasizing in the lung, a classic degenerative disease of the heart. You don't feed your rabbits with the right vitamins, especially vitamin E and selenium. They develop white muscle disease in the heart. Classic uh, enteric bacterial disease in rabbits, uh, Clostridium spiriforme, E. coli, Clostrid Clostridium difficile, inducing this classic fibrin cast within the intestine. And then a corneal melting ulcer in a, in a rabbit that was used uh, for reproduction. So if you have your veterinary pathology handy, send them a picture, Skype in, or her, because you've got plenty of uh, great uh, women in our profession, they can tell you immediately what you have. So before you lose all your colony, we can tell you what you have. And this is going to be sporadic. This is going to be epidemic. This is going to be sporadic or epidemic. This is going to be epidemic. You can lose, uh, you can lose uh, a thousand of rabbits, even for viral diseases. Or we can tell you that the overall this kidney is affected by encephalitosome cuniculi, which is also a vaguely uh, zoonotic disease, immunosuppressed uh, patients are, who is a special HIV. We know there are a couple of publications in some drug users in Italy. But we can tell you that, well, this, this kidney has got lesion, but unless there is an encephalitis, probably a rabbit died of some other causes. Um, then, um, not many people know that pigs make fantastic uh, experimental animals. And uh, this disease cost to the pig industry every year more than 100 uh, millions of dollars. This is an artery virus. There are not many viruses like this. that can induce vasculitis and pneumonia in pigs. You can lose plenty of pigs with it. And when the, when the virus enters in your, in your uh, environment, where the pigs are, in your population, it never goes away. Vaccines don't work so well, so it's very important to have specific pathogen-free uh, pigs. And we can help you with this because we can diagnose the disease readily at the microscope and even identify the agent within the macrophage of the lung or in this necro necrotizing pneumonia or even the rare, ca rare cases of encephalitis <coughs> in piglets. Or we can tell you if you have porcine circovirus. Porcine circovirus, the presence is common. But sometimes you see severe disease, like in the post winning multisystemic wasting syndrome. Circovirus is a virus that originally came from plants. There are a few of these around. There is one that uh, involves certain species of birds, the classic PCV2 in pigs, and then there is one that induces uh, um, chick anemia. And is a virus that loves to infect macrophages and pretty much wipes out the white cell population from the lymphoid tissue in, um, in, uh, in pigs and induce immunosuppression and several lesions. And then is a branch which is extremely important. Pets are becoming extremely important in, um, for the human population in any continent, uh, even in developing countries. And um, we see a lot of biopsies. We see a lot of uh, patients that are old and their, uh, their parents, their owners, sometimes we call them parents because they behave like parents or children, they want to have an answer, they want to treat uh, these animals. So we have comparative oncology, association between waste management and cancer in animals, uh, like in the Terra dei Fuochi, there's been some work related to lymphoma in dogs by a colleague of mine, animals and sent as sentinels for toxicity and tumor development. We see sometimes uh, toxicity in dogs and in areas where the owners can be exposed to the same toxicants. Plant toxicity, mycotoxins, uh, mushrooms. In California, often every year, unfortunately, there's a, the whole family die of Amanita mushroom poisoning. So the dog dies. The cat doesn't die because the cat is, mu cat is much more selective. But the whole family dies, or maybe someone survives with liver transplant because they get exposed to mycotoxins not about tumor or about toxicities. Virus-associated neoplasms, we have quite a few in veterinary medicine. They're being a big deal in, um, in human medicine um, as well for a while, like uh, um, Burkitt lymphoma, 
B cells, there is a form in dogs which mimics uh, the disease, which is I study at University of Pennsylvania these days. And then carcinogenesis mechanism, natural and experimental. A good, uh, a decent model of human cancer would be the urotelial carcinoma, transient cell carcinoma in dogs. The behavior is like in humans. The catch is that it's not as frequent as in humans. And can metastasize in dogs, this is the lesion, the urinary bladder, to multiple organs, uh, liver, kidneys, uh, 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 intervertebral spaces, heart, lung, and upper laryngopharynx, like in humans. Muscle tumors, which are very common in dogs. Some dogs are very expensive, so you don't want them to get uh, spreading muscle tumors. So we do a lot of uh, histopathology, molecular pathology, and this tumor because we try to grade them. And Dr. Cupel Michigan developed a grading system quite a few years ago, which is pr pretty solid, pretty effective, and we grade them often with the pattern of immunohistochemistry and then morphologic features. Eventually, this tumor may, may metastasize. I wonder four or five ransom tumor of dogs that uh, are a huge problem when they reach min middle age uh, and, and a little bit later. And then we've got some tumor that can be, other tumor can be um, model for human disease that get funded pretty well in the past, uh, and not only rodent, but also cats and dogs. And uh, there's been some study on prostate neoplasia using um, canine cell lines that's the classic prostatic carcinoma in a dog, which has got a behavior which is very similar to the human counterpart. But dogs are lucky. Dogs don't get it so frequently. We, our destiny as all male is to get it sooner or later. It's calculated if a human lives at least up to 100, everybody will get a few neoplastic foci. I wish I will reach that age with the tumor as well. And then classic uh, presentation in a dog, which mimic a human the prostate cancer which invades the bladder. And then we need to differentiate in this, in this tumor if the tumor is coming from the prostate going to the bladder with immunosochemistry or the tumor from the bladder is going to the prostate because this could be also a urotelial carcinoma. So urinary bladder tumor predisposed by smoking a human versus a prostate neoplasia which is pretty much uh, phylogenetically associated to the species. And uh, that's a prostate adrenal carcinoma intradural metastasis in a rat using some uh, canine cell lines. So you can use uh, canine and human cell line to study the metastatic process in uh, experimental animals. And then another tumor which is very common in dogs and highly malignant, which produce hypercalcemia. So it's very important to study hypercalcemia malignancy, which is a classic complication of neoplasia in humans and other species, the anal sac apocrine adenocarcinoma. And to finish, who doesn't understand the importance of papillomaviruses in the production of epithelial benign tumors, carcinomas, oral plaques in a dog transmitted by, by arthropods, which are based on papillomavirus, or this so much interesting tumor in horses, which is a sarcoma, low grade, which is a uh, mesenchymal, but several years ago, some veterinary investigator found that the papillomavirus was not an equine papillomavirus, but a bovine papillomavirus that was inducing a different behavior and, and, and proliferation of a different type of tumor in the skin of horses. So a bovine virus which induced a mesenchymal tumor in horses. And this tumor is a huge deal. The majority of the horses get it, and they recur, and uh, they produce a lot of damage on variable horses. So it's as important as basal uh, squalls carcinoma in the skin of humans. So, and we are at the end now. In summary, consider and borrowing my brain and my brain with my colleagues, veterinary pathologists, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a tendency in their heart to study also human diseases. In, uh, for animal natural diseases, laboratory animal diseases, how to handle a laboratory outbreak, zoonotic diseases, and this is frequent guy. He is frequent. Uh, do you want to go with serology or want to go with a complete autopsy where we can get all the possible answers? Zoonotic diseases, which are out there. You go here on the Altipiano, the Carso, there is Borrelia, there is rabies. 
There are other tick-borne diseases. There, is, uh, there, is, uh, there are flaviviruses and cephalitides. Animal physiology and pathophysiology, which is useful if you have a, you are a biology, you've got a lab with your uh, experimental species. Lesion interpretation. Sometimes a picture will give you a diagnosis. Send a picture to, to me via email. I can tell you, well, that's what you have. Inexpensive, and in 10 seconds, we got an answer. Comparative aspect of the lesion, which is extremely interesting. And interpretation of uh, hematoxyl eosin stain, histochemistry, which include Zill Nielsen, Gram, Fight Faraco, Jimenez, Machiavella, all the possible range of histological staining. Immunohistochemistry, direct, indirect, polymer, uh, multiple, incited hybridization, which is used uh, in certain studies, and then inside of PCR, which is a nightmare, but for certain studies, works uh, pretty much insisting and in doing it. Troubleshooting in the lab, it goes both ways. I help you, you help me, because you may have experiences that don't, I don't have. Collaboration on competitive international funds. To have a board certified pathologist in your team, especially in the United States, is paramount because when the reviewer see the grant and see that, you know, there is not a technician, with all respect to the technician, doing your autopsy, but there is in your tissue identification, but there is a DVM, PhD, diploma CVP with a solid background in science, they said, we can fund these people. These guys are serious. And same thing for the publications. These days, you know, when you see a board certified pathology, the reviewers say, okay, I can trust this study. Thank you for your time and consideration. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'm open to any question. Actually, I welcome questions, love challenges. So in, often from a different crowd, you get different questions. And any question, you're more than welcome. Even the most basic and even the most interesting.